Andrzej Sitkowiecki, and this is Q&A with Dima. The program is called Transformation, the Art of Reinvention in the Time of the Pandemic. What I have is very, very special treat. I've got two outstanding brothers, two fantastic violists, and also uh, the, the heads of, of an incredible clan of violists, which we will talk about. They count no less than seven violists among their means. I think it's the only family that I know that has quite that number. Anyway, welcome to Mikhail and Alexander Zimtsov. Welcome to the program, guys. Thank you. Um, great, great to be here. Yeah, great to see. Of course, I know them since 20 years, so I will be uh, they can call me Dima, and I will be calling Alexander Sasha and Mikhail Misha, if you allow me, because we never, we never we never call each other with the full name. Anyway, speaking of meeting, for the first time we met, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I'm pretty sure I'm correct because I looked it up. Uh, we met in November 2000 in a lovely town of the former... Uh, and still is a uh, Norwegian oil boom, which happened in Stavanger. And you were doing a viola boom at that time <laughs> in Stavanger. I came there to conduct and uh, there they were. Misha, the older brother, was the principal violist. And Sasha, who was not even 20, he must have been, I don't know, very, very young, but still in his late teens. Uh, he was also in the... In the in the viola section. So what I'd like to do now is ask you, actually, what, where have you been up until Stavanger? Because after that, we became good friends and I know you're like more or less, but before I really don't know. So Misha, you start because you started earlier. You were born earlier. <laughs> right, yes, yeah. So um, I tried to tell quickly the history of uh, our family, uh, um, our uh, mother, Ludmila Levinson, and, and our father, they both, uh, Evgeny Zemtsov, uh, they both studied in Moscow, and they met in Moscow. Originally, my uh, mother is uh, from Grozny, from Chechnya, and, and my father was born in Raskazo, in, in uh, uh, Tambov, uh, near uh, Tambov, it's old. Russian city. Mm -hmm. So, and then uh, they uh, met in Moscow, um, uh, and then uh, they they got married. They finished the, the conservatory. My father the conservatory, and my mother the Gnesin Institute. And then they moved to Ulyanovsk. That was uh, the famous thing, распределение, which people from other countries don't know. But it's actually in Russia, you, uh, in, in the Soviet Union, you were studying uh, for free, but then you had to, you, you would be sent somewhere by the government and there was practically no way unless you had very powerful friends uh, in the, somewhere in the Communist Party, uh, you were sent probably to the very far place uh, in the country. So uh, my parents were sent to... Ulyanovsk, that's not so far, it's maybe about 600 kilometers from Russia or 1,000 kilometers which from Russia, for Russia is very close. And uh, there was a, a new Philharmonic Orchestra created for some uh, anniversary of the birth of uh, Lenin. And the Soviet Union, many things were, were happening on the anniversaries of, uh, of birth of Lenin or, or revolution anniversary and, and so on. So this new Philharmonic Orchestra, uh, uh, my mom uh, was a viola player in this orchestra. And my father teached there in the, uh, in the uh, musical, uh, music college. Mm -hmm. So then to, to make the story uh, a little shorter, um, they uh, moved uh, finally to Ufa, to Ural Mountains, where Sasha was born. And uh, um, my father was teaching in the uh, Arts Institute, Institute Iskustv in Ufa, which was actually a very good institution with a high level. The, I think about 80-90% of the teachers finished Moscow uh, 
conservatory or, or Gnes Institute. So, so that was the actually this распределение, this uh, sending people uh, uh, through the whole country. It had it, it uh, positive sides actually for the country because you you nowadays still you can go to somewhere to far east uh, Harabarovsk or Vladivostok wherever and and you will meet very very good musicians. So Dima maybe knows this uh, very well. Of course, yeah. and that's how we have. You know, they have uh, wonderful uh, conservatories in faraway places like Novosibirsk, for instance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, but yeah. that's Siberia and so forth. But that was actually one of the one of the most uh, progressive things. I mean, of course, if you happen to be the one that was sent God knows where and you grew up in Moscow, you were not very happy. But for the for the distribution, for for uh, the education and for the you know, for the boost of music in the places to have those highly qualified the graduates from Moscow, from Leningrad at that time, or or Kiev or Baku or whatever. Yeah, it was a great uh, a great system of sending the specialists, so to speak. Yeah? yeah, and it was. But of course, you know, as everything with uh, with human beings, it, it depended very much on on your personal connections. And uh, you know, if you had somebody. Who could put the uh, you know? So you were born in Ulyanovsk, Misha. Or yes, I was born in Ulyanovsk, but uh, I uh, in Ulyanovsk it was at that time uh, uh, it was quite a poor city, so there was no much food. So and I I got very ill uh, after a year, and then my parents sent me to Grozny to my uh, grandparents, and uh, Grozny Caucasus. It was a phenomenal place at that time. It was no, hardly you could hardly call it Soviet Union because there was everything there was black market people were doing things and, and living actually very well yeah, uh, lots of fruit and vegetables and yes, food yeah. and, and the flowers and it's a very rich region used to be now of course it's very very different yeah there was a terrible war there that's yeah, yeah. But that, but, that, that happened later and Sasha Sasha you were how long were you uh, so you were born in Ufa yeah. I think, uh, as far as I know, Vladimir Spivakov was also born in Ufa, so it has a certain string, string distinction. Uh, what do you remember about Ufa? Were you, you were too, 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 too young to? to... Oh, I, I went to school there until I was ten years old. Wow! So you lived ten years. In Ufa. And then I still keep in touch with my friends from Ufa. Uh, it was a nice place, especially when you don't know. Uh, uh, what what is around for uh, for me for example when I first went to Moscow it was like going to on a different planet and uh, then uh, when I entered uh, the Ignatian school um, I, I just thought there is no pupils they are all kind of half gods <laughs> you know also the playing level was of course incredible and that was a huge huge step for me and. Uh, uh, for, for I, I still don't know how my mother, our mother managed this this move. Yeah, and uh, the thing is that when we moved um, uh, uh, before we moved to Moscow, Misha was studying in in Central Music School. So we I didn't see Misha since his age of thirteen and my age of four. So and then when we came to Moscow, Misha immigrated to Mexico. So the real time when we started to. Be, really become um, family was Stavanga. That was really? the that was the first place. And how did you get into Stavanga, both of you, like Misha first? So let 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 let's 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 skip uh, uh, skip that part and, and go to Mexico for just a little bit. How how come you went to Mexico from Moscow or from yes. from another place? Um, so uh, we had, um, uh, as Sasha says, uh, so I, I went when I was uh, 13, I went to the Central Music School. This is another fantastic thing uh, about Russia, because both Sasha and me, still in Ufa, we were studying in this special school where both the normal subjects and musical subjects were taught. And, and uh, uh, so... Um, after that, I um, I started with uh, Galina Adinets, uh, and uh, uh, she also teached in the conservatory. So, so I went also to the conservatory in the same class, and then uh, I met Yulia, my wife. I met her in the in the conservatory, 
and then we had a very very good friend who was a double bass player uh, from Mexico, Alicia Gandara. Uh, hopefully she is watching us today or she will watch this uh, this uh, interview. So and uh, uh, when uh, I, uh, we both had uh, neighbors, me and Julia, uh, from uh, Latin countries. And we started uh, learning Spanish like a game, you know, but then in, in a certain time, uh, in a year, we already sort of started speaking Spanish. And uh, this uh, poor girl, which came from Mexico, 18 years uh, uh, old girl, which came from to, to Moscow completely alone in the, this terrible winter. And, and, and uh, uh, I remember the first time I met her, she was just sitting in her room and basically crying. And we were trying to translate for her something, you know. <laughs> so and then so we we, we helped her as, as much as we could. But then she was also uh, after a while she was sent to Minsk, to the city where um, Yulia, my wife, is from, and her parents lived in Minsk. And this girl she became sort of adopted daughter of them. So she lived in their house and so on. And then uh, when she was leaving uh, to Mexico, she said, I really would like very much to invite you to Mexico. Uh, and, and they said, yes, thank you very much. But they, they didn't think uh, seriously about that. Uh, but then there is, uh, was Perestroika. Then uh, all the, uh, yeah, the country started just falling apart. And they also had uh, two younger brothers uh, uh, of, of Julia uh, who supposedly we would have to go to military service and there was Chernobyl and there Afghanistan, whatever, you know, okay. all this story. And also, yeah. So they were quite afraid. And uh, we also, we all uh, first got an uh, invitation from uh, Israel. So we, we could immigrate to Israel, we had this possibility. But that was exactly the year in uh, 89 and 90 where 200,000 people a year, a year we are com coming to uh, to Israel, and our aunts they they went there, the sisters of our mother, and and they told us, you better find another yeah. place because here here now there's not a moment to come to, to this country yeah. to travel. Yeah, yeah. And then so it was very difficult to convince uh, Julia's parents to 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 go to Mexico, but finally uh, we managed to to do that. We, we managed somehow to to buy the tickets, which was uh, you know it was a, a terrible. Thing. Uh, thanks to the um, uh, tours of uh, the uh, conservatory orchestras, we could save some some money and then the so hard currency. And you know, it that was the way for for the people to to survive. Those who had the chance to go get out uh, to go to, to abroad. So um, we just uh, actually uh, we didn't finish the conservatory. We were on the fourth year. And we didn't really plan to stay in Mexico. We just thought we would help our uh, uh, Julia's parents and, and her brothers to, to stay there and we would come back to finish the conservatory. Uh -huh. So we, uh, we came uh, to Mexico City. We stayed in the uh, uh, house of Alicia. And a couple of days later, she took us to... Uh, she just called the National Symphony Orchestra and, and she made an appointment. We came to meet Enrique Dimeke. The quite famous conductor is now chief in the Colon Theater in in, in Buenos Aires. Yeah. So um, we made this appointment, and he said, "Okay, uh, in, uh, on um, in five days you can play an audition for me, and then let's see." So it was like, "Okay, I also need to play audition. Great, but I don't have viola with me." <laughs> so we started uh, looking, searching for some friends of anybody who could lend me a viola. So in the two days. I, I got a viola, uh, and meanwhile, uh, Julia and her parents, all, all three of them are violinists, they had one violin, so they were practicing <laughs> this one violin, you know? and then we came, uh, we, we play. Uh, also the problem was I didn't have any music with me, So, but I knew by heart two pieces by Sulhan Tsentsadze, wow, Tarumi and Romance, and these two pieces I played in my <laughs> first audition. <laughs> And we got the temporary contracts. You know? yeah, yeah. So after a week of being in Mexico, we suddenly saw ourselves sitting in the National Orchestra and trying to play Eighth Symphony by Mahler. Wow. 
without any any experience in orchestra that, that was the most terrible thing because you just sort of sit there and you have no idea what's going on <laughs> you just don't dare play or not <laughs> that's well, more you, like. you were not terribly exposed because there were it's called the symphony of thousands so there were a lot of people besides you there yes you're fighting together with that yeah 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 at least so and and then while you were in mexico sasha was still in ufa or no, no you were in moscow, moscow. Right? In moscow. moscow in moscow you were in moscow and you had no uh how did you end up in norway because i understand that after mexico misha uh came to work how how did you meet now sasha tell us how how stavanger became the meeting point for you reuniting themselves yeah so so of course uh, because of all this kind of military service and all this chaos in in ex uh, soviet uh, union uh, uh misha couldn't come to visit so there was seven years we didn't see each other yeah uh, next time i think we met in the airport uh, was it Berlin or Hamburg when we already moved to Germany because after I finished nascent school my parents uh, reapplied for immigration so first one was Israel which they refused and uh -huh. the second one they uh, refused uh -huh. very much to immigrate to Germany so I entered Hamburg Hochschule and I think that was when we met with Misha and Misha tell me what what you came to Germany just to see us or was it already to do with Stavanger this I can't remember no 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 I, I came with the Mexico City Quartet I was a member of Mexico City Quartet and we had a tour in Europe and uh, and it was 97 maybe I think it was 97 and you do you just moved from Schwerin to Hamburg and uh, uh, we met finally met our after six years yeah old small almost seven years and, and i mean taking in consideration that we didn't really see each other as long as we were living in russia misha was just coming in the summer uh, uh mama was finding cigarettes in his uh, luggage and all that stuff you know the usual teenager come back uh, for me it was so exciting you know all this stuff you know she found cigarettes she made a scandal i thought it's so exciting yeah. <laughs> but it was very bad example well, I think, I think on the contrary, in retrospect, you were a very good example of how you could go to a completely unknown country that you didn't even think that you would uh, take roots in, like Mexico. You, you came without the viola, and you both, you and Yulia, a wonderful uh, violist in her own right and fantastic teacher now, so we have a double... Uh, viola act just in your family and before we start talking about the kids but i mean and 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 get a get a immediately into the the best orchestra in mexico after playing sulhan and sadze two pieces that you knew from memory that that makes a wonderful story i mean that 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 you could you could make uh a tv series just of of zims of uh, brothers uh, travel but in the meantime what was sasha's first impression when you came you came to germany first right yes. uh, i i mean uh, you know i i went with first time i was abroad it was with the school orchestra with the Ignatian school orchestra uh -huh. And we went to a festival in Paris, and that was the, I, I was 13, so that was kind of really, really impressive for me. And at that time, I decided that, that I don't want to live in Soviet Union anymore. I really, this is something what excites me and all that. Uh, of course, uh, like in the famous joke that there is a difference between the tourism and the immigration, uh, uh, those who know, uh, uh and uh once we came to germany of course it was uh, kind of a at some point a big shock because nobody nobody of us really spoke german uh but then then assimilation came very very quickly and uh, uh the for me the question about the job uh, was a little bit kind of a very early alarm uh because i had i had a son uh, very early um, uh, with, with, with 18 I was a father and uh, uh, so I had I had to find a job but I, I did send I remember I spent 120 marks to send applications to the orchestras and I got 20 times no and 100 times nothing so, so and then, then uh, I was kind of in, in the thoughts what to do 
And one friend of mine told, look, you, your brother plays in Stavanger. You should do something, ask him. So, and that's that's how it all started. And actually in that uh, time, uh, Misha Skolik, uh, because I think in Stavanger were, were two equal uh, solo violas who swapped all the time. So she went into uh, uh, per, uh, uh, maternity leave. Maternity leave, yeah. So there was a place. Yeah. Exactly. So there was yeah. a place for one year. Uh, for which I came, played the audition and won the audition. Then I was on trial, which was kind of a couple of weeks where I played a bunch of Norwegian nor modern music. And and they kindly offered me to be in the Tutti, which was a great thing. But the thing is that I, I still look back and I think how, how could I, with, with 19 or just, just turning 20, win that kind of freaky audition? And that uh, uh, maybe there is some kind of advantage that we didn't see each other with Misha so long, because Misha became for me kind of uh, a mentor who just explained me how this thing goes. He prepared me. He listened to me when I came to Stavanger. He listened to me every morning before the rehearsal. I had to pull off all the program at, at 8.30 or 9 o'clock. And that made me a good stamina. And also, of course, I had no clue about orchestral excerpts. Yeah, this was all explained by, by, by Misha. All, all first, yeah, and first time. Misha was trembling behind the screen because three rounds were screened. Only fourth round, they opened. And he didn't... Three rounds behind the screen. That's I never heard of this. Yeah. This is, must be uh, Norwegian special. Yeah, three, yeah. <laughs> they really don't want to see who's playing. It... <laughs> <laughs> And he said that there was some couple of other uh, viola players who sounded very good, but they started to do some mistakes and Misha started, and I played last. <laughs> so at every player, Misha was, ah, no, no. So, and then they opened the curtain and, and I played the, the, the rest of the program. And that, of course, was for, for me a fantastic start in the orchestral career because all, without this step and also without this um, uh, unsuccessful trial, uh, I would not go so far because I learned so much in these weeks uh, with this modern Norwegian ballet. I still remember some places uh, the trumpet played the 16 notes and viola had to play every eighth 16, so syncopated. <laughs> I wow, still remember, I still count it. Uh, Misha, Misha taught me how to count it because I thought the conductor will show us where to play with the left hand. Misha said, no. <laughs> <laughs> No previdei. Yeah, you can trust, but you check, as somebody said. You know, rather, no, this is you. You can never rely on the conductor. It's 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 a nice surprise when he actually gives you something. But but you should always rely later on. It's it's so so interesting how how you cut your teeth as a as a fabulous uh, both of you, fantastic and and very very successful. Uh, of course, principal uh, violists, but how you, how, I didn't realize that Stavanger was actually the, the sort of the, your university in a way, your working university. That's why you, 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 you but Misha, of course, was, was, was uh, before he was prepared by Mexico. Yeah. Very interesting because my, my, my impression is, as you, you said the other day, uh, that uh, Misha, of course, and I, we started uh, speaking Russian, and we, I, I visited him, and you, I realized that the, the brother, you were very quiet. You were very young, nineteen. You must have been nineteen at that time, or something, mm. yeah, or just twenty. I don't know. Uh, to, yeah. So, uh, but you, you played very well, but you, you hardly said anything, and you looked with those big eyes. And it's because we had Dohnani serenade on the program, which is not a walk in the park, and the orchestra was sweating bullets at some point in the scherzo but you you did very well and then of course uh it's not that the rest is history the rest is it very interesting in different history but then the next the next thing uh i i asked misha to but to give me a call if he comes to london and tell me uh you 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 called me because you came for an audition at lpo right um yes actually i um, when I went to, uh, for the audition, it was just a, a one day I could f fly in and out. Uh -huh. But then they, and, uh, uh, and LPO invited me for a trial. It was a, a principal place. 
and uh, and then I stayed uh, longer in, in, in London, and uh, and then I, I I called you. Yes, and that's when we got we got we got together. And so you 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 were on trial, and then when they were about to make a decision, you had another offer from the Hague, right? Yes, yes, yeah. So I I had uh, for half a year. I had a, a sort of uh, I was traveling uh, between Norway and uh, London. It was very very interesting experience, of course. But uh, London is a tough city, I must say. It's <laughs> yeah, especially for orchestral musicians because yes. they just have to, you know, do so much work in order to maintain, in order to pay the rent and to be able to live in this town. And some live very far because it's cheaper outside. But then yeah, but all these distances is 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 crazy. I remember yeah. having living in Gypsy Hill and uh, recording in Walthamstow Studios. So and you make two two hours actually if everything goes well. <laughs> yes, yeah. If you don't get stuck in traffic, or if uh, you know if all the trains run on time, which is not a given as we know. Absolutely. Oh boy, yeah. So you you decided to take the Hague job, and since then you've been in the Hague uh, with your family, and that's why you had two beautiful daughters. But in your place came the youngest, as it turned out, the youngest principal violist in uh i think lpo history uh 23 year old alexander zimtsov so they lost one zimtsov but they gained another zimtsov <laughs> newer one new model <laughs> newer, newer one. so how did that happen such you were already in commercial opera in the meantime yes so so during this one year contract uh, in in stavanga I, I started again, uh, you know, soon it finishes and uh, the job question was again open. Uh, and uh, actually it was the first audition after Stavanger. I went to Berlin and, and, and played there uh, and uh, got this contract. It was a, a, a kind of co-principal viola, ja, stellvertretender Stimmführer, which was absolutely uh, the right thing for me. You know, after doing uh, uh, the the Tucci job and then and then sitting with uh, fantastic, I had fantastic first viola from yeah. whom I learned a lot. We sat together three years. He didn't play one mistake. I don't know how it's possible. And he, he knew all Strauss operas by memory. He knew yeah. all all uh, Wagner. He played every summer in Bayreuth. Eberhard Wunsch is his name. He, now, he just now went into pension. Never aimed for career was top viola player and this kind of you know the highest of german um uh, you know the orchestral musician with 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 mission orchestral yeah. music with mission who yeah. knows yeah. much more and and dedicates much more than the job requires so and then i was i was actually quite happy in the job uh because uh, i had uh, to work a little bit less than the tutti uh, the opera was amazing because once you learned it, you play it many times. So then you don't rehearse. So and then it's evening, always busy. The mornings you can do whatever. As a young guy, it was amazing. Berlin, and, it's really Berlin was very exciting. In love with Berlin, it was a fantastic town. Uh, yeah, but but Misha didn't give me this piece, and he started to say, "Look, they opened the place again. We have to prepare." And uh, for me, it was uh, total nonsense because. I know how much more experienced Misha is, and and if he didn't, uh, you know, if he didn't get through this job, uh, how can I? But sometimes things are very very different, and maybe because also Misha already introduced to me all the pros and contras. He was already an insider. His his, uh, his introduction to LPO from him was something what i would never get so i mean it's we can say we got it with misha together <laughs> yes <laughs> collective effort <laughs> that's extraordinary we have yeah it was somebody that you might know maria prince so interesting i'm enjoying this very much so this is somebody <laughs> that you probably know yeah, yeah I'm, just looking for, I'm looking at for whatever questions <laughs> they might be because i have a whole list of questions but you wanted to say something about yeah. maria Yes, she's a wonderful pianist. She uh, was uh, 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 she she was married to the first clarinetist of of Vienna uh, Philharmonic, uh, who oh, yeah. passed away, Alfred Prince. 
and she is a chamber music partner and accompanist of the top clarinet classes in in the Hochschule in Vienna. Uh, very close friend of my of me of Denitsa especially yeah, because she's a Bulgarian from. Uh, uh, Denitsa Lavchina, of course, a wonderful clarinetist who you met in London, uh, uh, but exactly. then now you. You moved, but that, that, that we'll get to yeah. because there's a lot of chapters in your life yeah, that's it. that if we go through just just, just your life, we'll, we'll have at least three hour talk. But let's 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 keep sort of the highlights. Yeah. Now, as now Misha settled in the Hague and of course, now we started seeing each other because I would bring you to from 2000. I looked up from 2002. Uh, I think Sasha was actually the first one in NAS and then from 2003 Misha. And uh, Misha's been many times with NAS, and Sasha's now rejoined in this whole NAS virtual in this in this ex extraordinary, crazy year that we're still living in. But now it's 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 a little bit more going on, and you know, hopefully we'll be able to see each other before too long and uh, to see each other making live music. But how was? Let me just switch the gears from the life story. Uh, in the last year that we've all experienced, you've never really, because one of the questions reads, you probably never spent as much time at home as in 2020. What new have you learned about yourself during the pandemic? What has been a positive lesson from being at home? And of course, coming, uh, you know, that question to you both who already, for the listeners who've been following your travels from Ulyanovsk to Ufa to Moscow to Mexico City to Stavanger to London and then we skip of course Germany and Berlin and and later on Sasha went also to Lausanne and then Vienna and Cologne so there's so many you you live you you lead a very nomadic life like like I do even though I've lived in London now for many many years but that all always in a row but they, all of that came to stop uh, in March 2020, and it gave us a chance to stay more with the family. Let's start with Misha. W what What are your thoughts? Did you have any kind of contemplation? What have you sort of What have you taken as a result of this? More time for uh, thinking, more time with the family, and so forth. Yes. Yeah. I still remember this day, 13th of March of 2020, when I was. Uh, working in here in the uh, teaching in the conservatory in the hague and suddenly they just called on the on the on the radio uh, that uh, that we more, all must leave the building and that the conservatories will close you know uh, um, the thing is that uh, i have a certain maybe I, I would call it maybe a problem you know i cannot uh, limit uh, myself I, I like so many things you know if, if I'm uh, I have 26 students I was playing uh, literally every weekend I would play some concert either a recital or chamber music or or I would travel somewhere you know and uh, uh, and, and also of course I am uh, also conduct a, a youth orchestra in Rotterdam young talent orchestra and there is also a lot of work organizatory work and uh, and of course rehearsing and so and uh, at certain moment um, I had just if I think about half year before the pandem pandemic um, I had sometimes a feeling that my head is like a, a pressure pan you know like uh, those ones you know which they're called pressure cooker, uh, pressure yeah. cooker they say yeah. pressure yes, cooker yes, yes, like... yeah so that is get like <laughs> and I, I'm happy it didn't explode. It could, could happen at any moment. And you have so many projects together. As you know, I quit the orchestra in, in 2015, thinking that I will have more time. Yeah. But since that uh, moment, I had less and less free time. Because now when you're a freelancer, of course, you can do everything you want. You know, and, um, and the last time, before pandemics, I, I was feeling this, that I'm not able to organize my life the way that I also could have at least not one day, half a day in a week 
free or whatever. And and uh, my wife Yulia Dinerstein, she she has absolutely the same. Uh, you can call it uh, happiness or or problem. It's at the same time. It's <laughs> two things. And then when this pandemic came, yes. yeah, mm -hmm. you know um, the drive. On one side, I'm I'm really uh, we, we all hear all those terrible stories about the people uh, getting uh, sick, uh, getting uh, really uh, terrible uh, illness, getting into the intensive care and so on. But um, for me, I'm even I'm a little bit ashamed telling that. But but for me, it was actually one of the best times in my life. Because first of all, we were at home together with my wife, and we we are eating three times together. It never happened before, never. You see, we were still working. Of course, all the rest of the day we were teaching uh, uh, online or making projects as well. There are a lot of uh, streams and and recordings, and and NAS of course started already in the uh, in, in the summer. We were doing all the, our projects. You see, but uh, that was really amazing time for for us and, and, and for me personally, because I suddenly had time to th do things which I dreamt of, but never had the chance. I, I would never have a chance for this. Like some stupid things, like practicing piano, for example. I was, I was, I really dreamt about a little bit, you know, half an hour a day, a little bit, you know, I really love playing piano, but I can't do it. <laughs> you know, so so this kind of luxuries, you know, or or reading books, you know, or or or, or listening to to some uh, pieces of some lectures, so to to sit down and listen to whole Mahler symphony, you know, that that without didn't interruption. happen without interruption, yeah. Because so this, just just sitting there and listening to one hour to Mahler symphony, you know, so this this kind of things, you know, and. Uh, I must say it was a very special time, and uh, I, I I did uh, I, I finished, for example, some piece which I all of a sudden I think Misha yeah Misha. ten years ago, but I, I didn't have a chance to put, to write it down no time, but now yeah. now it was possible, you know this kind of thing. So it's a, so it's been it's been a positive positive slowing down for you, and what about you, Sash? Um, look, I mean, uh, the, the, of course, the, the, this stop was very hard, uh, but what came later is I, I'm, I'm very grateful to all this time. I mean, also very similar like Misha, I will not repeat, uh, I mean, things which you always dreamt uh, to do. Uh, and the contact with the family, the contact with relatives I actually made this kind of group. Uh, uh, online, where, where we connected all the relatives uh, in all the countries, and and we chat there, and we speak there, and we, we video call there. Right. Uh, also, uh, contact with the friends with with whom uh, whom I really appreciate. I mean, contact with you. Also, we don't we didn't contact so much as we contact now. No, because time, absolutely. Time there is need and all that. Also, the the the, the amount of reading I did. Uh, the, how you you know that that uh, I'm I'm last five six years I'm I'm conducting and and you know you know you always kind of dream oh I would take this time for myself and look through the scores improve the score reading analyze things like really calmly and this is a very nice fairy tale until yeah, someone tells you just sit at home and when you sit at home you actually have time for all those things and and. Uh, uh, I mean the the contact with my son, with my little son, uh, Alexis. Uh, it's it's really something what makes now huge part of my love a lot life. Before I loved him, of course I loved him from the day one of his birth. Of but this one love, when you fly around the world and you love him by by the phone and all that, and the other way when you spend hours and hours on bicycles in the forest reading uh, uh not, not only books also he, he's, he's he's very good now with with, with sight reading i i would never find out that he has this talent <laughs> i would never find out that he has actually talent for, for music in such a way that that it's you don't need to force him to do anything he's kind of you know he like, likes to read and he's quite great 
and 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 all, all these things with my wife says oh at least now we know we didn't make a mistake that we married because before we didn't live together so it could be it's a mistake but just because <laughs> <laughs> now you know you get along uh, now you know you can be you can be locked in together and and, and don't exactly. And they're not gonna be at each other's throat. Yeah. I have to say we got happier and happier. And also, I mean with, with Misha, we didn't see each other live over one year, but, but the contact we have and, and uh, the amount of time we call each other and we, we discuss things and, and and chat about things and, and share what we what we do. I know now also a lot more about his family and what his daughters do and all that. Because before that, you know, you come there and in one hour meal or two hours usually from one o'clock till three o'clock when everyone is tired of the content <laughs> you try to tell a year's story story and, yeah, to catch up yeah 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 but it's interesting when we talked the other day sorry to interrupt you but just just to prove the point uh, because uh i said when when did you see each other you said oh just a couple of weeks ago and it turned out you didn't see each other on zoom for two weeks but you actually did not see each other in real life for more than a year, right? Exactly. Yeah, but it's, it's interesting how this, this whole new way of communicating now almost substitutes the real, the real life. We, we get used to it, so because human beings are very adaptable animals. And now we think, oh, yeah, I'm Steve. Oh, I just saw him. I just talked to him. You know? But it's, it's, it's interesting how, how it, this, this whole thing, and, you know, uh, hopefully we'll come out of it wiser and and uh, maybe a little bit a little bit more also appreciative of what we have because I think that the, now that you've done quite a lot of live concerts and with the audience Sasha yeah so you were because I followed some of your concerts in in Bulgaria before they closed down I mean you had audience there yeah, I was I was quite lucky to catch catch couple of windows in other countries with thirty percent, with fifty percent in Moscow, with thirty percent in Sofia. Before that, in Finland also with with some some restrictions, but also with the audience. Uh, yesterday, you know, I did in Lviv a, a concert without audience. Uh, I, I mean, streaming. streaming. Yeah, uh, but but uh, you know, the, I now I start to think that you know doesn't matter how long our, this pandemic will will go uh, will be like this cloud er, above us we, we should not we should not get disappointed or whatsoever as long there is the contact as long there's players as long there's ensembles and all that and all these master classes online I find it's a great thing for example with Misha we have given master classes we did the soft master class for viola where we also could watch each other lessons we could never do this before couldn't even think about doing this before because when you do a real master class in in five days you are always busy and see each other for half an hour drink or lunch uh, yeah. but here you could spread your schedule so that once you can see how your brother what is the doing. other is doing yeah exactly we could see the other other people master class when it's recorded already you know at your leisure in the middle of the night or early in the morning whenever when you want to to see something specific speaking of viola some of your uh some of your colleagues and friends of nas violas they wanted to know now among the seven violas what instruments what's the equipment what instruments do you play so let's start with misha then we'll go sasha then you you tell me about the others what they playing uh what what makers, whether it's you know contemporary violas or old violas. So, Mish, you start. So, um, yeah, I had a, a long story of the of the instruments um, since uh, Mexico. I started with the with the Mexican uh, viola of two thousand Mexican pesos. Uh, it, it was um, I don't know what it was made of, but but I, I mean I was working on this instrument. You know, and little by little I. I was uh, getting uh, different instruments. I never had uh, extremely expensive instruments, uh, but the last um, ten years, I've played on the uh, viola of a Dutch uh, maker Daniel Royer from Amsterdam, right. and uh, he made this uh, viola for me. I think uh, 2011 he made this viola for me, and I was extremely happy so, with this instrument. Most of the 
all of the, the YouTube videos which are, uh, are they, uh, there are, are are made on this viola. Um, and then I, I thought that I, I would stay with this instrument for the rest of my life. And but then I I got a call from uh, our uh, uh, teacher uh, Michael Kugel, and he told me I must come to his city to hustle because there is a phenomenal viola which I must have. And I was like, goodness, again, a new viola. Okay, so I went there. And uh, indeed, when I tried this instrument, I, okay, I understand what you mean. It was a Gaetano Pareschi. It's a modern Italian instrument from 1950, uh, from Ferrara. And uh, the, the, uh, the last the last videos, like, like this uh, last Rose of Summer, which I put uh, put on, on YouTube, that was was already amazing. made on uh, on this uh, Pareschi, Pareschi viola. So I'm, I'm really happy about that. That's extraordinary. I mean, to, for you also to play the last Rose of Summer on the viola, I mean, it's hard enough. It's, it's so interesting now how times change. Uh, just making a little detour to the to that particular piece because uh, I grew up, of course, with my father's recording of the last rose of summer. Yes, we know this one. And at his time, there was, I think, he was the only one on that of that generation that actually could play it. Sasha also played this piece. So, so. Right. But <laughs> now, you know, sitting in the jury, I hear sometimes, you know, very young, uh, you know, very young people. Uh, contestants and they they have no problem getting through the uh, technical sides. I mean, they play all of those and pizzicato left hand and and harmonics and everything. And now you guys on the viola, that is a really because it's that much harder. It's that much harder. But it's 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 fantastic how how much you know the the technical level. So Sash, you wanted to say something? Yeah, of course. It all comes from Mikhail Kugel, with whom we both studied. Actually, not only we both, but all, almost all the seven violists. I think five out of seven violists of the so family uh, studied with Mikhail Kugel, and he he I think he does totally right thing. Uh, he slightly arranges the the violin pieces, making some things more in the viola style. And then there is still freedom. I mean, if you want, you can do the, the the original violin version. If you don't have this kind of stretches, you you just play slightly different intervals, uh, um, six three play ten three play six and all that. Uh, but he does did of course this fantastic thing because there is this huge gap in the repertoire uh, for viola that that uh, absence of of virtuoso music. Uh, there's there's no no not so many. Uh, violists who wrote with the exception of Maris Vio Herman that, that's it you know we don't have then they were all just a concert studies that that's it we we don't have this kind of uh, you know Vitan Vinyavsky all that stuff which violinists can not build. even Primrose not even Primrose wrote anything yeah, yeah. even though he was such a fantastic violist he just arranged he arranged Paganini for viola he kind yeah. of did a similar thing yeah yeah, and uh, regarding the instruments, I, I mean, I also went to, to a couple of Russian instruments. Actually, LPO job, I won on a Russian instrument. Now I can reveal it after so many years I left because I, I, I actually lied to a lot of people that it's a known maker, old unknown maker. But it was actually very, very known, made in 1980s, Mirnov. But Mirnov, yeah. But they, like, they, they bought it because yeah. it sounded good in your hands. That's 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 the whole thing. And I, I have now, of course, I understand that that the let's say thirty percent of time of practicing was dedicated to, to make this wood sound better. But but he was still talented. And I, I remember that when I first brought it in Hamburg uh, to the maker, he took it like this. And he, he looked at the pegs and said, "And the pegs are from Caucasus," <laughs> 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 because he couldn't believe how but but the viola sounded good, and then I went to other couple instruments. Last last uh, five years, I play uh, borrowed instruments. Uh, it's because of a very close friend of mine, and he he was violinist. Now he deals with instrument. He just gives me one time to time the, the instruments to play for a long time. I played the viom of his for quite a while, uh, uh, and then I play. Um, now I play uh, Pietro Gaggini. Oh. It's modern Italian, very beautiful, really beautiful kind of a pop. I, I, in general, I mean, because this question comes from violists, I, I believe that modern viola making is, is 
is a replacement for old because the old is so limited. I played also half a year, Gaspar de Salo, uh, 44 and half. Yeah, it was very, very, very tricky. It's like like this, yeah? The so norm. The problem is to, to get the first position when you have to stretch the hand in the first position. Yeah. But but incredible sound. But of course... Um, it's impractical. Impractical. It's not suitable for Bartok concerto, let's say, yeah? where, where you have to go over all the instruments. So, and the modern instruments are... There, there's. I, I, think, I think the modern viola making is in front of violin making because I don't yeah. see so many good violins as so good violists and you, uh, not so many anyway yeah because uh, Stradivari made how many violists well 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 you know for and we have uh, now twelve hundred violins probably you yeah. know that he made and only twelve so that's you know one one two two to a hundred. So, they, you know, and the others, they did not, except that's part of the sour, but as you said. Of course, for, for me, for me, if we speak about old um, uh, violas, it's 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 much more Brescia than, than Cremona. Yeah. Because after perfection of Stradivari, is proportion, it's not suitable for viola, the, the Stradivari's measurement. And Stradivari made, made violas very, very similar measurement, just enlarged, like a violin. That's yeah. why Stradivari violis, violas will be never uh, the thing of the heart of violis as, as Gaspar de Salle. That's probably because they have a different sonority completely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But they are, of course, huge and they are difficult to play. Unless, as uh, some some such a happy coincidence happens, like with Amichai Grosh, where the instrument is just kind of perfect. I think it's still cut down, but not much. But but it's it's really it's really kind of a perfect Gaspar de Salo viola. It's part of this. There's a there's a question very relevant to what you were just saying. But this this comes from Greensboro, North Carolina, uh, because I know my friend was asking it. Uh, custom made instruments by modern luthiers a, a top choice for virtuoso level musicians, or are original vintage instruments always superior? I think you've answered that. Yeah. In some ways, but uh, maybe Misha wants to, to elaborate on that. Um, could could you repeat the question? Yeah, custom made instruments are custom made instruments by modern luthiers a top choice for virtuoso level musicians, or original vintage instruments always superior? Yeah, um, you know, um, in that sense, uh, this collaboration with uh, Daniel Royer was very interesting because I got first. Uh, an instrument uh, by him um, from a national uh, foundation, the Dutch National Music Instrument Foundation. And uh, I liked very much this instrument and uh, therefore I, I went to meet him. And uh, from that moment uh, he started, I think, making just violas because uh, so, <laughs> so many people were interested in his instruments. I think okay. he made uh, like 20, 20 instruments, which uh, uh, many of our students, our acquaintances, everybody who have seen uh, my instrument, they were got immediately interested about that. And and they, uh, you see, and he was experimenting a lot, and and we were talking a lot also about what is what is important, you know, about for example about the importance of. Uh, uh, being comfortable, the, the neck, you know, that it must be not to not to think, it, you know, this this kind of stuff. Uh, importance of the not to have too too big uh, abicheke, how to say this? The, this yeah, yeah, yeah. This, uh, the, the side uh, sides of the violin. Yeah, the, the side of, of the viola that must not be too big because for us to play virtuoso repertory, you know, if if it is just two millimeters bigger than it must be on this side. You always have sort of obstacles, you know. So he sort of uh, find, find out the the best uh, patron uh, for that, and uh, so uh, and uh, yeah. So in this, this sense, I, I think this is very interesting a collaboration with a really good uh, maker who who can listen to you and who can experiment. You see. Yeah. yeah. Also, for, with modern instruments, uh, there is uh, for kind of let's say for every taste. Because now in Europe, you know, uh, no, not only Germany, uh, France, uh, 
but but there is in so many countries now good makers sometimes you meet uh, there, there were a couple of polish very good makers yeah swiss i mean i met few very good makers dutch uh, yeah so and you can you can go on and and all of them are interested in the viola making because there is uh, you know there's sh shortage of good violas and if you if you aim for this kind of vintage instrument you get something and then it's too small too big not your kind of sound not this or not yeah. that so it's not like violin because violin at least there is a, a model which which always has more or less the same measurements exactly all it could vary it could be really just a little bigger than violin or could be as you described you know 44 that's really huge i guess part of the i've seen them and i've played with Jaraco seco has this yeah. enormous yeah. enormous viola or, or violas but you have that wonderful magini viola i don't know whether you saw no, you, yeah. you you never did because he he, he, he passed in 2002. Yeah, Madrini, anyway, but fantastic viola maker extraordinary sound extraordinary sound but you know there's such differences between in sizes and therefore you know i think it's it's interesting that, that it just reminds me of several situations but i remember when i got finally I, I, many years ago in 83 i got my strat uh you know and i've been playing it ever since except i do have now a, a superior sounding copy and most people cannot tell. I fooled a lot of my colleagues, very, very distinguished people who, who heard, who sat on, on the jury with me in Montreal. There was Pierre Amoyal, Pavel Vernikov, Boris Kushnir, and so forth, Pam Frank and everything. And then they heard me play, not, not just a little uh, diddly, but, but the Goldberg variation. So they were there on stage, you know, listening to me for an hour. And then we did also a couple of encores with the things. And then, of course, they come in. Oh, of course, that's your famous uh, uh, Reifenberg, you know, 1717. I said, yeah, well, look at this. I mean, it, it, it does look pretty terrific, but except I hate to disappoint you, it was made in 2018. Oh. There was this big shock. I mean, nobody knew. And How we stay in Russia, Dima? Не умей амати, а умей играть. How you would translate this? Yeah, well, it's it's not important that you have an amati. You have to know how to play it. And 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 I remember when I met, uh, uh, you know, one of the times when I when I saw uh, not only perform but when I would see Rostropovich. He was of course this great, uh, you know, mind and full of jokes and 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 interesting he said steak steak old man he would always old man what would you play on i said well now i just you know i just got myself straight away i said that's not good he said well i said why mr slavia he said you know when i used to play uh storioni i i, I had i did my for years and years i played so they would they would ask in the orchestra they would ask what are you playing he said story on you oh what a, what a great cellist now i play this strad and they would say what do you play is it straight you are really <laughs> <laughs> so he said it has the opposite effect is that if you say straight you are, of course it plays by itself we have another uh we have another uh comment here uh i experienced a lot of sasha's concert as conductor live and, and it even had the pleasure to be his soloist with Lviv Orchestra, but never ask him when and why he decided to start conducting. That's a very good question. Thank you, Maria. So, Sash, I will ask both of you what is it was was on the list. You know, what makes a great instrumentalist want to become a conductor? What was your motive, Sasha? Since the question for you first, and then I'll ask Misha because he does also conduct. Actually, with your question, you just said the 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 title of my master work of conducting which i am doing now so this yeah. is another thing which i which i managed during this pandemic i i managed to 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 i will manage in two weeks to complete my studies uh, uh, and so so i already did my exam uh, conducting but but uh, it which was stream actually from moscow so they just looked at it I see. but but uh, the um, the thing is, is is exactly this question which is so interesting for me 
I I think I had I had two reasons. Of one, of course, we we you know people discovered now um, the the scientists discovered this mi mirror neurons. You know, if you look at something and you like it, you you can't help you. Uh, yeah. So you you start it. And and I, as a violist, I I sit uh, of course in front of conductor, and all these amazing people which conducted LPO. They just gave this kind of an example how music is made, and um, of course the uh, maybe the the absence of of too much technical language, you know that that there is so much inspiration and all that that moved me very much. Another thing maybe was also the orchestral smoking room, uh, because people say you know in the, before that there used to be smoking room and people used to ah ah you know conductors and what. It's so easy, and that 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 also kind of teased me because I wanted to try whether it's really so easy or yeah. Or maybe they, they were wrong about that. <laughs> they were very wrong about that, of course. But but it as easy as it looks, it's actually such an incredible profession, um, uh, very inspiring profession for for an instrumentalist who we are we you know we are crazy about this touch and here. We touch the, the the instrument and it sounds certain way, and suddenly you have this kind of a wireless touch. <laughs> Wi-Fi, <laughs> Wi-Fi, musical Wi-Fi, yeah. And, and it's just wireless to people, and and it's a kind of it's a little bit mystic, no? It's a little oh, bit absolutely, mystic, you know that. But but there was never like one day I woke up and I thought I want to be conductor. It was never like this. There was this couple of things, you know. The, the smoking room, the great conductors, and, and this thing, you know, like what, what would it feel if between me and the instrument and the people are the instrument? It's not me playing, but there is this kind of thing that you have to show with the, with, the, with the hands to, to create kind of an atmosphere. It's, it's a, a little bit mystic work. There's definitely that. Misha, I'll let you uh, say it and then I'll, I'll, I'll tell you my idea be, uh, behind the conducting which is not dissimilar but uh, it has a specific specific point uh, Mish, you go ahead yes, uh, i still remember sasha started uh, earlier than me with the conducting yeah. and i still remember uh, how he, he showed me a video from a master class of some conducting teacher in london may mayor maybe was his last uh -huh. matters that was in 2007 that was my first ever conducting master class i just wanted to go in front of the orchestra and conduct something an experience yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. so and then uh, uh, uh it was uh, second symphony by sibelius i remember it uh, until now and then uh, when i've seen this video I actually understood at this moment which direction Sasha is going to go because there was a, uh, I, um, uh, he was still just starting he was very uh, of course completely unexperienced but but there was a certain thing which which I could recognize uh, you know like sort of some magnetic field which which is extremely important the most important thing in, in the conductor uh, so uh, in my case uh, I, I never thought about being a conductor, um, of course, I, I played for 23 years in the orchestra. I, I have seen so many conductors, and I've also been um, a member of uh, artistic committee of uh, the Hague uh, Orchestra, of a residency orchestra, for seven years. And my task was a scouting of uh, conductors going to the concerts and, and uh, finding new names, uh, etc. So it was a, a very interesting work, but. Um, it didn't have any connection with uh, uh, why did I start uh, conducting because um, in, uh, there is a, a school um, in uh, Rotterdam, Helendal Music Institute. It was the first uh, place where Julia started, my wife started teaching in, in Holland. Mm -hmm. And uh, in this school there was uh, an orchestra, uh, Concerto Grosso. There were, um, uh, youngsters from between th 13 and 18 years old more or less and uh, their conductor left and and this uh, this orchestra was like a, a, a like presentation like vi visit card of the of the school and and they were very worried about that and Yulia uh, uh, told me wouldn't you like to to try to work with the kids I thought should I 
Okay, so we spoke with the director and she said, okay, just try that. And um, I started working with this uh, youngsters. It was a uh, string orchestra. And I liked it very much and they also seemed to be happy. And, uh, but the, the bad thing was that I had to conduct on a concert and I, I made a video of myself conducting and it looked so much worse than the, all the conductors which were considered bad <laughs> in all the orchestras, you know. Uh, so if I was a violinist, I would just lead from the first chair. But being violist, it's a little bit strange. Right. So, so I thought, okay, some, some friends told me, you know, don't worry, you just go take three, four lessons and it will be all right. So I went, uh, I had to, I remember I had to conduct Polka Pizzicata. Oh, yeah. so, so I, I went to uh, to an uh, amazing, fantastic musician and conductor, Lev Marquis, oh, yeah. who lives in The Hague as well. And I asked him uh, uh, how to conduct this pizza polka because I, I had no idea of those fermatas and pauses. So he explained me. That was my first conducting lesson. And uh, th that's the thing. When you start learning conducting, your first... Uh, stage is you are, with every lesson you understand how bad you are doing this <laughs> you know and even conducting children still you you go on stage and you must do something which somehow must be similar to something decent and and like this i went more and more asking for the lessons for different people and finally i understood I, that i need to to study it properly uh, and then on the festival in Switzerland, I played with the National Orchestra of Lithuania as a soloist. Uh, and also I met their chief conductor, Jozas Domarkas, uh, who, uh, uh, who was for 50 years chief conductor in this orchestra. He is maybe the longest chief conductor in the history. And he uh, was also teaching in the uh, National Academy of Lithuania in Vilnius. So I started going with him first as a private student and uh, after two years I entered the master's in, in the school and I, I finished the master's in, in uh, um, uh, symphonic and operistic conducting but still I mean this I have my diploma you know but it doesn't mean anything yeah, yeah. You, you never you end the, on the podium you cannot just wave your diploma and set it you know? exactly yes yeah. Yeah. but but of course this when I started uh, learning conducting actually I figured out, but all my experience watching conductors uh, when I was in the orchestra, I didn't have a clue, you know. When, when you start really uh, learning the techniques, you start understanding how the thing work, and, uh, and, and you know, uh, uh, you just, uh, you, you could say, I like working with conductor or not, but all these technicalities, you know, if you don't really study it properly, you have no clue about that. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a body language and it's also a technique. Yeah. It's interesting because for me, of course, uh, having played with so many conductors, mo much more as a soloist, of course, than in the orchestra, but still, you know, uh, when you start, it's such euphoria. You know, you think you're conducting, and especially, you know, I started with NAS, you know, what became the uh, 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 orchestra that became NAS. Phenomenal. So I had a Stradivari to start with before I knew how to play it. So it started, it, the sound was phenomenal. I mean, because everybody was just so good. And of course, you think you're a conductor. No, that's a big illusion, of course. Uh, you and so many uh, young conductors like myself at that time, we think that we conduct. No, the real conductors, I believe, you, you become only when, you, in my opinion, just as an instrumentalist of a high order, uh, whatever we talked about instruments before, the reason I could fool people whether I play the Strad or I play a modern instrument is because I have my own sound, which is recognizable for people who know me. And I am able to get that sound even from rather poor piece of wood not well there but my sound is just like my mother who can make an upright piano sing how does she do it it's a miracle but she does have that her own sound and i believe that the really great conductors they bring that's where the mystery is how do they do it uh they bring just by being there 
or they already emanate a certain sound. You begin to play in the different musicians don't necessarily even know how it happens, but they bring their own sound. And for me, the biggest example in art of conducting, there's a very good film many years ago. I'm sure you've seen it. You know, not the Bernstein, who of course is quite fantastic, or Karajan, or the others, but Stokowski, who conducts BBC Symphony. The orchestra who couldn't be further away in its sound from Philadelphia. But for him, they sound just like Philadelphia. And therefore, he was not the most modest man, but he, he was a very capable man, obviously. And when, when somebody asked him, he said, oh, but what about Philadelphia sound? Said Philadelphia sound? It's me, he said. And he was right. Whatever orchestra he conducted, they had that phenomenal Philadelphia sound. So that gave me an idea that why uh, am I doing that? My, one of the biggest desires that I had ambitions, if you want, artistically, is to be able to bring the sound that is mine, that is only, whether you like it or not, that's another question, but as long as I can, within the first rehearsal, as you get all better, it, it happens sooner, or a number of rehearsals, if I get my kind of sound from whatever orchestra I'm conducting, then, in my opinion, then you'd be coming a real conductor. Before that, you can have fantastic technique, you can have this and that, the note from memory, this and that. But if you don't actually change the sound of the orchestra, I think there is there is a big, big difference there. Speaking yeah. of the sound, we have a number of things uh, uh, that we need just to touch on because we've talked about the instruments a lot, but I believe that bows are just as important. So there is a, there is a question to you both about the, uh, about the bows. Uh, what, do you think the bows are important for, for playing and what kind of bows or bow makers that you could mention? Let's just you know, mention a few. Go ahead. Again, I, again, for me, it's not a kind of a fame of the bow. I, I have one very fine Lamy bow. It's really very, very nice and all that. But but um, I play more often uh, a modern uh, bow by Roy Quay, the Canadian maker. And uh, uh, so it's, it's a question about quality. Of course, with if someone didn't have, uh, didn't put enough... Uh, time in the bow, bow making and doesn't understand so much about the relations of the weight and all that of course this bow cannot be good i know that a lot of students play have to play with some fabric bow 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 it's unfortunately but but of course with some help from the right hand uh, it can be done also so never never give up there's also this kind of sometimes i feel between students that starts this kind of secret they just put the bow maybe maybe later you know like first thing when we when we do when we start to do good things with right hand that, that that's already quite quite good and as yeah. you say you know that so that the, the player can can bring his sound that that's what we as players should be interested in uh th this is my view on all the instrumentarium you know there's some people like hair spread out some might like more hair someone thicker on one side more and this and i tried all of those I, I cannot say there's one which is perfect. One does one thing better and the other other thing better. And then you ask your right hand what 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 where it needs more help. And and uh, that that is maybe uh, you know that people think for on viola very often. Oh, heavy bow is great. Yeah, for some thing is great, but for some other thing is not. You know. So. <laughs> That's interesting, Misha. Anything different uh, as far as bows? Um, yeah, I I really like trying different bows, uh, and it's a little bit it's a endless quest for me. So I'm I'm all the time trying different bows, and and yeah. and I always have uh, four bows in my uh, case, and I I try. I I think also it's good to, to know also for the for the students that uh, I have a strong opinion that from every bow we'll learn something, you know, and then sometimes. Uh, I see that I can help my students to to manage a certain bow stroke. For example, if it doesn't work with one bow, you try several bows. One of those bows sort of does it better, you know. So, so this is interesting thing. And um, 
And so um, and, and now, for example, I'm I'm uh, uh, I'm I, I bought a, a very uh, nice uh, Schmidt uh, bow. You know, this is yeah, modern famous, bow, famous which uh, 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 Daniel uh, I bought it from Daniel uh, Reiskin, who was a phenomenal uh, viola soloist, but he is now conductor for many years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So and then he made he he went to Schmidt himself. He's very a uh, careful uh, and serious person so he went to Schmidt and he told him exactly how this bow has to be and, the uh, and there's this fantastic bow uh, I, I use it in the string quartet and it is articulates uh, really phenomenal and for solo playing uh, I have uh, a couple of uh, French bows like uh, not too expensive ones you know Morizo or Bazin and yeah. uh, a couple of uh, German bows as well that's great. Well, having so many violas in the family, you have to. You have to have a lot. Now, you've mentioned, of course, your, 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 your students, and both of you are extremely uh, active and committed teachers. So there is a question here. What does teaching mean to you both? Uh, so how, how does it work? Because I never taught as much as I actually have taught in the last year, because now I give a lot more, you know, every every week I give several lessons to certain students and to some colleagues. If they ask me, it's a different, but I'm not a professional teacher, so to speak. You've been professional teachers in uh, uh, since many years, and Sasha now, uh, uh, pretty much half of Europe you, you teach in, uh, you taught in Lausanne, you left L LPO after 10 years, and then you taught in Lausanne, right? And then in Vienna, and now in Cologne. So you have, Norman, you said, uh, Mish, you said you have 26, and Sasha, how many students you have? I have, I have actually less students than Misha in both conservatories, Köln and Lausanne, it's about 19. 19 that's a lot that's plenty so you've always said so what how can you answer a question what does teaching mean to you both i i for, for me it's a very easy question because uh you know when when i was in the orchestra first the relationship to the orchestra was i have to just get the level and pass the trial and be at the level of my colleague of colleagues then you feel you gain the experience and you are kind of one of them and you are part of it and you are doing something good for it for the orchestra orchestra does something good for you you do something good for it also and then you see the newcomers to the orchestra which are having a lot of gaps and having a lot of uh disappointments uh, uh, after auditions that moved me to to teaching uh, I left LPO not for conducting straight away. Conducting was still just a very much beginning. Yeah, it was it was for the teaching. For the teaching. Yeah. Just, I thought, you know, what what is better if I play until sixty five in LPO, or I bring up uh, hundred, hopefully, three hundred violists who will play in orchestras of that level. Of course, as a life mission, the second choice is much better because I had my pleasure for 10 years. Uh, they also deserve. And very often, uh, there's really talented people instrumentally just are victims of disinformation because they don't know how to prepare orchestral repertoire and, and what, what, or how, how orchestral musicians hear and click, you know. So what 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 when they they orchestral musician listens viola lines, but in his mind uh, sounds all others, and this is what can happen with, with the student. That's why they play sometimes unrhythmic or unlogical phrasing and wrong accents. And but it's not because they are wrong, just because their their mind is not tuned into this, uh, uh, into this kind of um, uh, orchestral. So this kind of you know audition preparation and and giving the students the the, the, some information which will bring them to professional because, because once you once you got into professional group whether it's a whether it's a quartet ensemble of course for me orchestra was was amazing w whatever you know whatever orchestra i loved commercial opera as la as much i love uh, london philharmonic i i can't say you know philharmonic orchestra was better or worse or whatever also, in london philharmonic we played in the summer glyne this beautiful opera festival 
So, so that, that that was the reason, and this this still stays like this. Uh, the aim for my students is to make them, you know, that they are professional, not that they play this piece well. They they have to play many pieces well, and they have to sight read well, and they have to to learn the music quickly and to do so many things well. But but main thing is to give them this kick uh, that they start professional uh, work, and a lot of my students. Uh, start to work during studies and I'm very proud of it sometimes I have problems from the directors they say they could not go to lessons but uh, I, I I have my own opinion I think master student should start at least practicum from the first year and in the second year it's better that he gets the job because when he gets the diploma and he still doesn't have uh, experience with auditions that's a bit too late Absolutely. I wish, I wish you know, more violin teachers uh, would be listening and having the same uh, sort of philosophy because they, it is most important to equip, uh, you know, to give your student sort of the survival tools, you know, how, which will, or to, to establish certain principles for his or her life uh, for the re so they could improve in whatever situations they would find themselves continuously but also have a job that they could support themselves you know because so many unfortunately uh you know brilliant teachers uh as violin teachers i'm talking about they just concentrate on solo repertoire but how many of their the students realistically can sustain a solo career? And then they come out and they never really did any orchestral experience. They don't know orchestral repertoire. They don't know chamber music. They don't know, and they're completely naked. They're unprepared for so-called the street life, you know, for the real life. You know, they've, they've been in that cocoon among their friends. They're all going from one competition to the next competition and this and that. And in the end, what? You, you, you wanted to comment on that, Sasha, yeah? yeah no, but Dima, you know uh, uh, from your own and the experience of all your distinguished uh, friends and colleagues that there is nobody just soloist. No. Okay. Every soloist plays chamber music and if he's a good soloist, he plays chamber music wonderfully. And uh, uh, some of string players, orchestral instrument players, have or orchestral ex experience. I think it always helps. I, I think I think for a violinist to play a couple of years in orchestra only can help. Of course, uh, there's this kind of um, wrong opinion that uh, the form goes down and all that. Of course, if you stop practicing, the, the form goes down. But if you want to uh, keep the form, it's only you know. But now this thing changes between the young uh, generation because people um, want to play in famous orchestras. They want to know the people they watched on, uh, you know, on, on the on the on television, on on streams, in yeah. in big halls and all that. They they want to. Uh, to be have access to them, to exactly. the, the, the have a, a, a ability to meet them and talk to them. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Because this is so additionally so important to what we study at the conservatory. Um, the, the, the conservatory, I think, is exactly just this kick to the that they become colleagues with good people. That's for me most most important thing. And, and that's, I hope I answered. No, no, I think you, you answered very well. And, and and we'll go to Misha if he has something to to add to that. Uh, what Sasha and I, we, we were talking about to, to answer that, that question. Yes, uh, actually, in our, uh, our family has a long tradition of uh, teaching and being teachers. Um, our both parents were, were teaching all their lives. And um, uh, we both started uh, uh, our studies when we were kids. We started with our mother, who was actually a um, very, very good uh, teacher for viola. She was a viola player, but she had also a violin uh, students. And, um, you know, the interesting thing is uh, now I'm 51, and uh, I'm just... Uh, thinking sometimes about all the experiences I got from all 
my teacher studying with my mother and then of course the Galina Adinets, uh, which I was in the conservatory. Uh, in, the Me in Mexico, uh, I studied with the uh, father of, uh, of my wife, uh, Boris Dinerstein, is a phenomenal uh, pedagogue and a coach. He, he actually prepared me for all the auditions in Mexico and, and also in Europe, because the Stavanger audition I, I won still before I came to Michael Kugel. Really? Yes, yes. So, so, uh, and, um, uh, and then, of course, I, for example, I said in, in Mexico, I was co-principal there. Uh, finally, I, after this, it's inside the audition. I had to make five auditions more with normal repertory <laughs> to get my place in the orchestra. But then um, uh, there was uh, also Mikhail Talpiga, one of the most famous uh, 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 Soviet viola players, who came there and he was a principal there. And that was uh, uh, I was sitting next to him for seven years, and and uh, that was the absolutely phenomenal school of of uh, of being a pr principal, and you know, uh, and then of course um, uh, 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 Michael uh, Kugel, uh, that that was just uh, another uh, dimension, and so I'm think about all these experiences and and uh, about the joy which I have. Uh, having possibility to give this uh, ex all this experience to new uh, generation you know and and many times i'm uh, for example i tell something uh, to some student and i'm not sure anymore where did i get this idea from which of my teachers or maybe you know where did i hear so this melting of all this fusion of all your experiences uh, this is a phenomenal thing but of course, the teaching is, uh, is uh, I'm absolutely sure, it's, uh, it's not one-way road. So we, we learn from our students uh, uh, sometimes more than they <laughs> learn from us, <laughs> you know. And, and I think uh, it is just an amazing uh, creative laboratory, you know, with, with all these different people, different students, uh, with different characters, possibilities, uh, problems or advantages. You know, so so I'm extremely excited. I think I think there is also uh, uh, at certain moment, at certain age, or or a certain stage in your life. This is the extremely important way of uh, development, of self development, and helping uh, develop to develop the, to the other people. So, absolutely. Yeah, I, I think it, Misha brought yeah. me to, to to add some some things because, uh, for example. I, I uh, uh, the only same teacher we had uh, with Misha was was Mikhail Kugel, who of course did influence me a lot and developed my technique and did make me free and all that. But I, I had in total, uh, I think it's uh, I had four viola teachers. So Elena was was my first uh, viola teacher, fantastic quartet player and already gave me so much you know she, she was introducing things you know i had for example to go and listen every concert of borodin quartet that was a must in our class yes. uh, and and uh, i i became big fan of uh, quartet repertoire yeah and then the second uh, teacher was marius nikitiano who was orchestral principal in the air i knew him very well yeah it was wonderful he was a tour with him yeah he was he he, uh, he was incredibly kind guy, incredibly kind guy, and was 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 friends with everyone and would never say a bad word and all that. Very very sweet. He sounded fantastic. He had fantastic old viola, and and uh, and very very generous and very very nice. He would give four hours lesson and all that. So and then was Mikhail Kugel who was kind of you know the injection of something totally new. But then, when I was already in London Philharmonic, I thought like I need some updates, some something stylistic, something so, and and I thought uh, that one of my favorite players was always Tabia Zimmerman. So I did a, a, a postgraduate program, Künstlerisch Weiterbildung des Studium at the Hans Eisler in Berlin with her. I didn't know you did that. Oh, wonderful! Yeah, yeah, and that and that was totally something different. And now when I am teaching my students. No, especially for example with Russians, who, who have very little information about the Western uh, playing and Western style, yeah. and this kind of, you know, uh, thing 
is very much appreciated here in the Western orchestras, you know, m much more articulated, much more pronounced playing, a playing which suits to the winds also, you know, so that, yeah, that yeah, yeah. so the sound is, is very, very produced very in a, in a very uh, pronounced way, spoken way, yeah. So, so it's articulated, a, a, very articulated, yeah, yeah. Exactly. No, so that Tabi uh, changed a lot, and and she she we still we are in incredible relationship. She played with me once as a soloist. I'm so so proud of that. Uh, oh. Alton Alton concerto uh, uh, I I conducted for her in Sofia Philharmonic, and then we played an encore. That was actually first time we played something together. And yeah, there's uh, an encore. Oh, and, wonderful. And and then and then um, you know all this all this kind of summer. If you only do it in orchestra for the job, you are too egoistic. You have to share it with the young generation, and you have. I already started to teach at Guildhall when I was during the time in uh, of London Philharmonic. I did mainly kind of um, uh, audition preparation, and when I started with the bachelors, that was this, was the challenge. When you get a, a bachelor with a lot of technical gaps then you understand that teaching is not just a decent preparation and this is still challenging for me this is something what i you know just before we go because i think it would be very important for the young ones also to know how do you sustain their spirit now because for the for this pandemic obviously you both uh went through it and became even you know it, it 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 had a lot of positive things for you somehow because of the connection with the family to be able to do what you described but for a lot of young people it's been a very devastating time the ones who've been working before lost all their work and the ones who were hoping to get work later on now it's a big unknown now i think for you two who have an extraordinary uh not only backstory which we of course we we've, we've touched upon but also you have a wonderful source of uh joie de vivre yeah so you have a life source so like misha said he has this you know non-stop uh, pressure cooker and sasha in a different way also is intensely uh, uh you know ambitious in the good way artistically ambitious which also reveals your drive, your inner drive. How can you uh, give it to the, uh, you know, how could you instill some optimism and give them certain tools not to get depressed, not to change their profession or for something else? Maybe they should, some of them, maybe they should for to, to, to earn some money because it's very difficult. Unless you have an orchestral job that pays, and we know out of all the London Oaks, there's only two of them have actually salary. Mm -hmm. So if it, if it's at the top of the profession is like this, and we've known about famous Oaks not paying and so forth. So what would be your words of encouragement? And what do you tell your own students or your colleagues who have a harder time? Because uh, you know it's it's very difficult to uh, as 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 the uh, as the saying in Russian says, "Siti Galodnova ni Yeah, the one who is not hungry will never know what hungry feels like. So, if you were given that kind of a question, what would be your uh, your 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 words of encouragement? Um, so, if I uh, may. Um, it is, of course, when we spoke, when we spoke about pandemics, uh, that's the first thing I said because uh, I, I realized very well that uh, if for me it was uh, really uh, actually great experience uh, uh, to be uh, able to have all this free time and so on. For many people, uh, it was very hard time and just basically to surviving, uh, you know, financially surviving economically. And I know all this also uh, from my students, many of my students uh, who were actually had all gigs and stuff and so on, suddenly they, they, they didn't have uh, work and uh, even my, many uh, students were, were working in the restaurants and hotels, you know, having just a, a little yearning, little money and they, they lost these opportunities as well. So 
this is uh, of course a uh, hard, uh, hard period for, for many people and also for the young people who who are just for example starting their careers and which is uh, going very well and suddenly it's a complete stop and and they don't have so much uh, um, uh, back package let's say so so resources or, and so on um, I think in that sense and also what I what I was uh, wanted to say about teaching the students we must uh, realize one thing that when we are teaching somebody to play viola or to do anything else or to I don't know to ski or, or to make uh, artificial intelligence I think the most important thing that we must be aware that we are um, dealing with the human beings and, and that we are irresponsible for th those people. They, they can do, do different things, but still uh, they, they, must be, they must develop themselves uh, as human beings. And this is extremely important also in the hard situation. How you, what is your... Uh, how you per perceive the world, you know, how do you perceive the life and how the, do you uh, uh, deal uh, uh, with the difficult uh, or happy situation, you know, this happy situation can be also such a actually a challenge for somebody not to get crazy, you know, we have seen so many talented people who, then who when they got careers, they, 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 they didn't uh, manage uh, uh, dealing with that you know they, they probably maybe became less good musicians but but very problematic human beings unfortunately we have seen a lot of this uh, coming so um, I think the uh, important thing is uh, that we always see anything which happens in our life as a opportunity and and not uh, not as a um, how to say it as as uh, as a disaster, you know? Any any disaster is as yeah. well an opportunity, you know. And and for young people, difficult difficult to understand this. When I was young, I probably also couldn't understand this very well. Uh, but uh, I uh, did have uh, moments uh, uh, when uh, when I didn't have money to to eat for to buy food or to to buy food for my family you know that the, we did have several moments like uh, like this in our life but looking back to those moments um, it, it was actually a great experience you, you learn from difficulties more than you would learn uh, probably from from happy happy times you know so uh, the most important thing uh, we must just realize everybody that that uh, um, the difficulties uh, are making us stronger if we really meet them with the right spirit and uh, and, and 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 right way. That's very yeah. good, and Sasha. Now I see that for many students and many actually people of this young generation, maybe this was the first hardship in their life at all. This, right. this thing, that's right. because this this generation is growing They're not up prepared for it exactly yeah. They're growing up with freedom freedom means uh they can do whatever they want so they they actually go very much by little short terms wishes so they for them i think it's very difficult because they most of them don't see this long-term good which also uh, you know, for me, when it was the stop, also it, it, it was kind of a shock. But now I see so many good things. Uh, I have to say that I have seen a lot of positive also in my students. I mean, first this thing with recordings that they all have to record themselves, to present for auditions and all that. This is a work which they do. It develops the level of their practicing. Really, so it, it rockets. You know, it rockets their ears refined and i remember that i always bought uh for the last money the uh, newest machine which came out for recording whether it was this tape or then the next and then the mini disc and then i have i have the graveyard at home of all these machines <laughs> because i bought everyone which new came out because yeah. i wanted to hear myself 
I always was my dream to go to the hall to sit like this and listen how Sasha is playing. I yeah. still couldn't manage to do that, but at least the recording helps. It gives you some perspective. Yeah, this is one. Another thing, how I try to encourage my students also to say is say that this reset, which happened now, I mean, easily to say they have as many concerts now as famous musicians, everyone is down to zero or <laughs> just, you know. So this after this reset, someone who spent this time productively, uh, he will have more chances. And I'm sure about that. Also, uh, there is not a big drama if someone changes profession. If he finds himself in a new profession, this is actually maybe the huge luck. And if music continues to be the love love of his life, and he goes to concerts, or he will start also to write reviews, and all the, I, I am a big uh, uh, supporter of this. And uh, I, I think the main thing is to tell them, look, nothing should be drama. Of course, again, how you say, say, city Galodnova and Yozumit, those who have they yeah, can't of course yeah, uh, I, try, I try to understand of course I could I, I sometimes imagine yeah, let's say we started with the Stavanger story if it would happen back then and I am this you know 18 19 years old violist who practices and wants to get a job and it there is no chance so easy, isn't it? yeah yeah but but there are chances I mean it, we do would, this, be, but, it would be a different a different life story because I've mentioned in previous talks that this is actually not the first time when I had such a long uh, period of uh, without concerts. This is, uh, of course, it's been, you know, I, they still continue to cancel just now. Switzerland canceled, Austria canceled uh, uh, Salzburg master courses. We still have things canceled, but now I have some things that I'm really looking forward to, which will happen in two weeks, hopefully. But I had a period when I did not see the stage for a year and a half. And I was only 21, 21, 22. That was just prior to my uh, uh, immigration to the, uh, you know, to the States. And I was already given concerts because I started early, uh, you know, with competition. So, of course, on one, you know, on one hand, you have the whole life in front of you. So you have you know, this, this kind of anticipation of another life. Here, we don't know how much our lives actually will be different. We already have all the difficulties of testing and the quarantine and this and that, the other. But I think as long as we have some kind of a return of concerts that you've been giving, Sasha, or you, Misha, and soon I will be hopefully in the same boat, uh, I think it gives all of us a chance to reconnect for real. Because as you said, and you mentioned, you know, we've never spent actually so much time uh, communicating with each other. You know, we, uh, Misha and Sasha, you've been part of this. You know, we made 15 videos, <laughs> distant videos, and yes, from Seattle to Moscow. You've been very much part of it. That's a fantastic achievement. In normal situation, would not be possible. But of course, you know the uh, this, you know the the, the the difficult situation makes one think creatively and all that. So, but that's all the positive things. In terms of negative, I think if you really manage to, you know, to turn your own drive, your pressure cooker as as, as Misha named his own situation or your life ambition in a different form. So be it. And at that point, whichever life uh, turns uh, turns out to be, maybe it's a, you know, we never know. It's it's nice to say, uh, but it's, it is historically true that after that horrendous, uh, epi, uh, uh, you know, uh, horrible, black death epidemic in 14th century that came renaissance of 200 years so let's hope that maybe it will be some kind of a renaissance of people connecting wanted to connect and wanted to give each other and think that they're not alone and it's all not it's life is not only about you being the center of attention but it's about people that you love, your family, your friends, your colleagues, and people 
who wrote that wonderful the uh, music that we perform and the ones that we perform it with. So thank you so much, the Zemtsov, the extraordinary Zemtsov brothers, the, the Zemtsov family. Thank you so much for joining me. We've gone, I think, the longest, but of course, the two of you, they're here uh, so far, but it's it's be, it's been wonderful. Uh, we have wonderful comments, which you I'm sure you you could you could see later on YouTube. So please, this week after which I will take a break because I'll be on the road and it's difficult to do it on the road. So we'll be doing some reruns, but don't forget to subscribe, which is free to my YouTube channel where you could see all of those uh, videos that we talked about that we've made with NAS and many more of both Zemtsovs and everybody else. So I'll see you in a week and thank you very much, Misha and Sasha for a wonderful, wonderful hour and a half. That we spent thank you so much, Dimitri. it was a fantastic opportunity. Fantastic, really, real pleasure. Real pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you.